Okay, great. Um, so I'll actually be talking about adversarial examples and adversarial training today, rather than generative adversarial networks. Uh, they both have the word adversarial in the name, but they're uh, different things. Um, I'll cover a lot of different work in this presentation, and my goal is to give you a high-level overview of the general topic area. Uh, to be clear, some of the things I'll tell you about are not my own research work, though most of what I talk about I, will, I have participated in at least as a collaborator, if not as the first author. And uh, this slide will be posted after the workshop, so you can use this to look up any of the papers for any of the topics that you're interested in. Um, as a general overview of what I'll talk about today, I'll first describe what adversarial examples are and what causes them. Then I'll describe how they can be used by an attacker to compromise a machine learning system. And then I'll talk about how you can actually improve machine learning systems using adversarial examples in the training process. And finally, I'd like to announce a new open source library that can be used to generate adversarial examples in order to test how vulnerable a given machine learning system is, or in order to train it with adversarial training. And in honor of Clever Hans, Clever Algorithms, the new uh, library will be named Clever Hans. So first, adversarial examples are examples that are used as input to a machine learning system that have been very carefully modified so that they cause the machine learning system to produce the wrong output. In these images here, I'm showing one from a paper called Explaining and Harnessing Adversarial Examples. But they've been known for a longer time before that. And they're the same basic idea as going back to around 2004, when people first started studying how to fool spam detectors. Uh, but newer versions of the idea emphasize attempting to make it so that the input is indistinguishable from a normally occurring input. So in these images here, on the left, there's a picture of a panda. And we add a very small perturbation to it. The image in the middle shows the direction of the perturbation that we add. But we actually scale that direction down enough that it doesn't actually change the 8-bit representation of the image. So the image on the right, as displayed on the monitor, is exactly the same as the image on the left. But the 32-bit floating point representation of that image has been changed enough that um, an inception network misclassifies the image as being a panda, or as being a gibbon rather than a panda. This problem does not affect only deep neural networks, as many people originally assumed. It actually affects essentially every machine learning model that we've tested. In this image, I show what happens when we attack a linear model. It's just a shallow softmax regression model trained on the MNIST data set. As we read from left to right and top to bottom in this grid, I use gradient ascent on the log probability of different object classes to make the input be recognized as all 10 different handwritten digit classes. So we start with an image of a 9, and we gradually transform it until it's recognized as a 0. The yellow box indicates that it has been successfully recognized as a 0. Everywhere that a yellow box appears, the algorithm has successfully visited the next class in the sequence. So this one is recognized as a 1, this one is recognized as a 2, this one is recognized as a 3, and so on. As you can see, nothing very much changes about the input that means anything to a human observer. We see some kind of background noise added to the image, but we don't see the actual characteristics of the handwritten digit change. The only box where a human would agree with the machine learning system about which digit is present is the very last box, where we agree that it's a 9. But that's only because we initialized the whole process with a 9, and nothing much changed about it throughout the entire optimization procedure. So why exactly is it so easy to fool machine learning models, especially softmax regression? When we first discovered adversarial examples, or when they first came to our attention in the deep learning community around 2012, we originally thought that they might come from overfitting. So here the story is that we have a training set consisting of three examples of one class, where each x represents one training example from the x class, and each o represents one training example from the o class. We could then fit a model that assigns a probability distribution to uh, the choice of where different classes occur. We can use the blue blobs to indicate regions of high probability of being an x, 
and then green blobs to indicate regions of high probability of being an O. Because the model is very large and can represent strange, complicated regions, it tends to overfit and just assign random blobs of probability mass, like this green blob over here and this blue blob over here. According to this hypothesis, we then get adversarial examples just randomly, where this point here is labeled as a, an O because it lies within this green blob, but it probably should be an X because it's so close to all of these Xs. And likewise, this point over here is labeled as being an X because it's inside a blue blob, but it is in truth an O because it is so close to these O's. So that story started to not really hold water. We started to find some unusual things, like that different models trained on different subsets of the training data would actually misclassify the same input points and would assign the same classes to them. Other signs like these started to tell us that something more was going on besides just random bad luck resulting from overfitting. There was a systematic component to it that had to be explained somehow. We found that actually adversarial examples can be explained much better if we think of them as coming from the model being far too linear as a function of its input. So here we have the same distribution again. The training set O's arranged in a curve, the training set X's arranged in a line, and we have a linear model fit to this data set. This linear model successfully separates the training set X's from the training set O's, but we can easily find new test set points that are different from the training distribution that cause the model to make mistakes. For example, this point here should and relatively far away from the arc of O's. However, it lies on the O side of the linear separating plane. Similarly, this point here is probably in truth an O because it is obviously an extension of the arc of O's in the training set. But it lies across the linear separator and is therefore misclassified. One of the main problems that we see with a linear model is that it's forced to assign very high confidence to any point that's significantly far across uh, the separating hyperplane. So if we travel over here to the extreme lower left corner of the input space, we'll actually have even more confidence that this is an X than if it were near one of the training set Xs. In other words, linear models tend to extrapolate with far too much confidence and become more and more confident as you move farther and farther from the places where the training data lies. We now believe that this is a major factor in what causes several machine learning models, including deep neural networks, to uh, misclassify adversarial examples with high confidence. Modern deep nets are built out of piecewise linear uh, components, such as rectified linear units or LSTM modules. LSTM modules can be seen as being linear over time because they essentially just add information, which is a special case of a linear operation. There are other models that are known to work about the same as rectified linear units. For example, max out units are piecewise linear. And they show similar behavior when presented with adversarial examples. Also, we find adversarial examples for uh, sigmoid networks. And we find that when sigmoid networks work well, they've usually been carefully tuned so that the activations are usually more or less in the linear part of the model, especially during the early stages of training. To be clear, I'm saying that deep networks are linear as a function of their input, not as a function of their parameters. Uh, many different parameters are, are multiplied together to produce the output. So they actually have important nonlinearities as a function of the parameters. But viewed as a function of the input, we usually can observe how the logits change as we vary the input. And we see that the logits are a piecewise linear function of the inputs, and that that, um, that function has very few pieces, usually around two major pieces for any particular linear cross-section we look at. So here we actually trace out input space on CIFAR-10 with a deep convolutional network. And we see how it classifies different points in space. On the uh, up and down axis, we use what's called the, uh, we just use a random direction that's orthogonal to the other axis. On the horizontal axis, we use what's called the fast gradient sign method, where we just take the gradient of the cost we take its sign in order to find a direction that will cause the cost to increase quickly. To be clear, this is the gradient with respect to the input, not the gradient with respect to parameters that is used to train the network. So within this space, we can see how the network actually changes as we move in these two different directions. For several different examples, I plot different cells here on the right. Each cell shows how space around a single test set example is classified. <coughs> 
in the very center of the plot, we're right on the test example. As we move to the right, we're moving in the adversarial direction. As we move to the left, we're moving in the opposite of the adversarial direction, which usually causes the confidence of the correct classification to become greater. And as we move up or down, we're moving in a, in a random direction that's orthogonal to the, the strongest adversarial direction. As we move from the center to the right side of the plot, we end up making perturbations that are big enough that it's actually a little bit difficult for the human to recognize the CIFAR-10 image. In this case, we pre-processed CIFAR-10 to have a standard deviation of about 1 per pixel, and the perturbations go up to a size about 0.3. So what we see in almost all of these plots is that there's a very straight line running very close to vertically through the plot. And that means that in, as you move in the, adversarial, in the adversarial direction, we find that space is essentially divided into a pair of half spaces. We also see that the random direction, as you move up and down within the plot, has very little effect on how the example is classified. In terms of the color coding of these plots, the white regions indicate places where the model correctly classifies the input, and the different regions like this green region or this blue region here show different incorrect classes. So we can see that usually we begin in a correct region, and as you move to the right in the adversarial direction, we move it to a different half space, where most of that half space is classified as being a single incorrect class. So this tells us that adversarial examples are distributed in dense and large regions that extend for a very long direction in a, in a given, in, in, for a, a chosen angle, and that they are not uh, like fine pockets that are very hard to find. You more or less just need to know the direction to move in, and then you'll find them even if you add a lot of noise after going in that direction. If we use random directions to make both axes of the map, we find that actually most of the time we begin on a correct classification, and as we move in noisy directions, we remain correctly classifying that input. There's also some cases where, because this is the test set, we actually just get the example wrong, and the perturbations don't cause us to ever correct our mistake. Uh, and then there's a few rare exceptions to that. Like here, there's one that was incorrectly classified, but the noise can actually fix it. The main thing to take away from these maps is that most of the cells are completely white, so all the random points surrounding the input are correctly classified. This shows us that adversarial examples are very different from noise. Uh, you'll often hear people speak about adversarial noise, which is uh, not really a correct terminology, because adversarial examples are actually constructed by uh, a systematic process rather than a random process, and the chance of them occurring randomly is extremely low. So the reason that uh, adversarial examples are appropriate for today's workshop is that they're a case where we have evaluated the model and the model feels like we have asked it to do a certain kind of task. But what we really had in mind was something different. So Clever Hans, the horse, was trained to do arithmetic. And he learned to fake arithmetic by watching people's facial cues and, and other social cues. When those cues were masked, he wasn't able to do it. So similarly, machine learning models are, are not any kind of intentional fake, but somehow or other they have ended up uh, solving the task in the wrong way, and their misconceptions are exposed by adversarial examples. They've learned to pick up extremely linear cues that happen to fit very high dimensional data sets, where most of the different object classes lie in different directions from each other, and they don't actually need to do more work than that. But then when we build adversarial examples, we show that they don't actually have a good overall map of the input space. They've just learned that one direction is the general direction of the island of pandas, and another general direction is the general direction of the island of gibbons. But they haven't really learned the contours of each of those islands, and they haven't really learned about the ocean of garbage in between valid classes that they should recognize. So one thing to keep in mind when we construct an adversarial example is that we need to make sure that we don't accidentally create one that is valid, where we actually change the class. In these images, I make several different perturbations that all have the same L2 norm. We begin with the same three in the left column, and we can actually make a perturbation that legitimately turns it into a seven. We can make a perturbation that just adds some noise and doesn't change the recognizable class. Or we can make a change that actually erases part of the three and leaves us with just some garbage that isn't actually a recognizable digit. 
So when we actually construct adversarial examples, we need to think of a way to make sure that we don't really change the class. In the case of images, what we usually do is we assume that if no pixel changes by more than some small amount, then the class can't change. So this is obviously domain specific to images and also object recognition, uh, but it works very well for that domain. Usually we can do this just by placing a max norm constraint on the size of the perturbation that we construct. But this also tells us this, this fact that we can construct a change from a 3 to a 7 with very small L2 norm. This tells us that a wide class of defenses can't actually help us. Specifically, we can't use weight decay in linear models to prevent adversarial examples. Because if we add enough weight decay to make sure that this 3 and this 3 are classified as the same, we will have restricted the possible slope of the model enough that this 3 and this 7 cannot be classified differently from each other. In other words, the interclass distances on a lot of tasks are so small that if we were to restrict the slope enough to prevent class changes, to a, if, if we were to make the slope large enough to allow class changes as we go from two real classes in the training set, we would also automatically allow a lot of adversarial examples to occur. Overall, um, you can build uh, adversarial examples very easily in closed form by taking the gradient of the cost function with respect to the input, and then thresholding that gradient to just be positive one or negative one, to take the sign of that gradient. This is based on uh, making a Taylor series approximation of the cost, where we just linearize the cost around the present input. And we can then say, what's the worst possible thing that we could do to this linear model of the cost under the max norm constraint that I described based on that um, requirement that we don't actually change the true class. So this is uh, the absolutely correct exact thing to do if the cost really is linear as a function of the input. It turns out that for deep neural nets, the model is close enough to linear. And the cross entropy loss we usually use is close enough to a hinge loss that this actually works very well in practice. Another interesting thing is that adversarial examples where we take a correct input and modify it slightly are not the only way that a, a network can make a big mistake. Um, another way is we can actually have a garbage class where uh, just an input that should not be recognized as any particular example is actually recognized as being a specific class. So this is mostly explored in the paper Deep Neural Networks Are Easily Fooled from Jeff Kloon's lab. One additional aspect of this problem that we can observe by seeing that deep networks are very linear is that it actually doesn't take very much to fool them at all. This is, in this image, I show you what happens when I take uh, Gaussian noise with a relatively large norm and feed it through a CIFAR-10 classifier. Everywhere that the noise is encapsulated in a pink box, that noise was actually recognized as being some specific class. And appropriately enough for this workshop, about 70% of RN was recognized as being the horse class. <laughs> right. I did not do anything to cause that to happen. It just worked out that way. Um, then the other interesting thing is that if I take the fast gradient sign method, and instead of trying to increase the cost, if I take a step following the gradient of the probability of a specific class, I can cause that class to appear with high probability. So the yellow boxes indicate places where a single step of the fast gradient sign method has successfully the, turned the noise into airplanes. Uh, airplanes were the hardest CIFAR-10 class for the attacker to cause for this model. Uh, the easiest CIFAR-10 class was obviously horses, where the attacker doesn't have to do anything, uh, and they'll win 70% of the time. For airplanes, there's about a 25% success rate using the fast gradient sign method. Overall, you can see out of these 100 samples in this grid, there are only two examples that have neither a pink nor a yellow box. So these are the only cases where random noise was not recognized as being anything, and the fast gradient sign method didn't successfully turn it into an airplane. But basically, most of RN is misclassified. And our clever Hans of an algorithm has really only learned to fake doing the right thing on a very thin manifold immediately surrounding the training data. So another thing that's interesting about adversarial examples is that they tend to generalize across different models. Because adversarial examples arise from the model essentially implementing a very linear function. Because different machine learning models trained to do the same task need to generalize. 
we'll find that different models trained on different subsets of the data will learn more or less the same linear functions. Here I actually show you the weights of two different logistic regression classifiers trained on different subsets of the data. And you can see that they learn more or less the same weights. So they'll be vulnerable to the same adversarial examples. That makes it possible for an attacker to actually thwart your model without access to your model. They need to either be able to construct their own training set for the same task, or they need to be able to send inputs to your model, query your model, and observe its output. Uh, if they're able to observe even just the class that it outputs, not even the probabilities, they can train their own copy of your model with uh, far few examples than it takes to construct a training set. And then after they've made a model that mimics yours, the adversarial examples will cross, the, will cross over from theirs to yours. This is true even if you don't use the same learning algorithm as each other. So this slide shows how well adversarial examples transfer between entirely different learning algorithms. Uh, the diagonals are pretty bold because you know, this is transferring from one algorithm of the same type to another algorithm of the same type. But we actually get non-negligible transfer for uh, quite a lot of other pairs of algorithm types. Uh, like going from a deep neural network to k nearest neighbors. We actually get close to about a 10% transfer rate. So we could actually just make 10 adversarial examples for a deep neural network, and probably at least one of them would su succeed in fooling the nearest neighbors classifier. Nicholas Paperno has demonstrated that this works on uh, remotely hosted machine learning models that he doesn't have access to from Amazon, Google, and MetaMind. Adversarial examples also transfer across different transformations of the input, like, for example, displaying the adversarial example on a printed page and then taking a photo of it. This means that you could theoretically go out and modify objects in the world and have them be incorrectly recognized by autonomous vehicles or robots, and that you can actually fool the, that model even though you don't have a model of the camera and the optical process that creates the final image processed by the system. Um, one interesting thing about the transferability property is that it shows us that the human brain must work in a very different way than modern machine learning systems. Because we are not fooled by the images that we show our machine learning systems, and also they are not fooled by the kinds of things that usually fool us. At least it's very easy to write a program by hand that can tell that these circles here are concentric rather than intertwined spirals. So you're probably wondering how to defend against adversarial examples. A lot of the obvious attempts that you could do, like adding stronger nonlinearities to the network, using weight decay, adding a lot of noise and training and so on, have not actually worked. Most things that are traditional regularization approaches haven't really worked because adversarial examples are different from traditional overfitting. They're more of a problem where the model is not choosing to use its full capacity and become very nonlinear. And they're about generalizing further than just to an IID test set. They're about generalizing to completely different parts of RN than have been explored during training time. The main defense that actually works is just the brute force approach of rapidly creating adversarial examples during training and training on them continuously while training on regular data. So in the plot on the left, I show what happens when we train with uh, adversarial examples. and um, sorry, I show what happens when we evaluate with adversarial examples. I'll, one more attempt, I'll get this right this time. Okay. <laughs> in the left, I show what happens when we evaluate a model as we train it, evaluating on clean examples. And in the right, I show what happens when we evaluate on adversarial examples. The green curve is what happens when we train with adversarial examples in the mix. And the blue curve is what happens when we train with only the original training data. So we can see that when we evaluate on clean examples, the blue curve works reasonably well, and adding adversarial examples actually reduces test error. It has a regularizing effect that makes us get better, even if there is no adversary. On the right, we see that the standard training algorithm is essentially completely vulnerable to adversarial examples all the way through training. It really does nothing to improve our abilities on the adversarial task. And adversarial training actually causes the loss to consistently go down over time. This plot is actually a few years old now. It's now actually possible to get um, much better results on the adversarial task using this approach. So one caveat is that you'll only become resistant to the kind of attack